scrutiny. I'm Paul Thistlewood, I'm the Council of Statutory Scrutiny Officer. Um, I'm Melanie Wright, I'm a brand new scrutiny officer. It's my first meeting, so. <laughs> Treat your and we've got Sarah uh, and Megan from Democratic Services who are trying to get the technology working. Uh, deputising for Brian Pope, Assistant Director. Ashley Jeffries taken up a new post of Head of Access and Resources from the 19th of September. I'm currently employed within Hampshire County Council Children's Services as a Senior Transformation Consultant. Susanna Smith, Assistant Director, Children's Services. Richard Vaughan, Deputy Head of Strategic Development, Children's Services. Um, Jade Kennex, Chief Development Officer. I'm Councillor Demi Andre. I'm the Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Education and Lifelong Skills. Councillor Claire Richardson. Uh, Stephen Hendry, County Councillor. Working. Okay. County Councillor John Midland, County Councillor Martin Oliver. County Councillor Tig Outlaw. Jane Howarth, I'm County Education Manager for Inclusion, uh, deputising for Brian Pope. Uh, Peter Congnut, Assistant Director. Rob Sanders, Church of England, representative of the committee. Carla Bradshaw, Clerk to Alifai Head Teachers. Simon Richards, Chair of Governors at Hainless Primary School. Caroline Sice, Head Teacher, Lanes End Primary. Uh, Maggie Sanderson, I'm the Executive Head Teacher of St Mary's and St Thomas's. I'm Lizzie Granger, I'm Head Teacher at Shalfleet and Tiamas Church and Northern Primary Schools. Dave Adams, Isla White County Councillor. Thank you for that. Uh, are we ready as of yet? We're ready to go. Oh, how exciting. No one has actually dialed in, so that's just... Is he? Steve's still waiting to be admitted. Um, I'm sure he won't mind us doing the first couple of things. Uh, we don't need Steve until a little bit later on. So, um, to go through the timings, um, well, declarations of interest will allow a couple of minutes for, obviously. We've got uh, no public questions, I don't believe, so we don't need to allow any time for that. We'll do a couple of minutes on there he is, progress and outcomes. And then we've got uh, the first main item is school place planning, which we'll allow 40 minutes for. And I appreciate there's a lot to do, so we may overrun, but it's just as a, as a guide. 10 minutes for item six, 15 minutes for item seven, 15 minutes for item eight, and then a couple of minutes for the work plan. And then we'll allow 15 minutes at the end for members' questions. So hopefully everybody's OK with that. Uh, previous minutes, everyone happy that that's a true and accurate record of the previous minutes? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Outlaw. Any somebody second it? Thank you, Councillor Hendy. Well, well, that's being signed, Chairman. Obviously, the, the councillors have introduced themselves, but just for the formal side of things, we've had apologies from Councillor uh, Lever, Councillor Downer and Councillor Ellis, and that's why we've got Councillors Medland, um, Richardson and Oliver here tonight, Chairman. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Hendry, you are first off the box, and then we've got Councillor Oliver. I'm a school governor at Holy Cross Catholic Primary School and Queensgate Foundation Primary School. Okay. School governor at St George's, Newport. Okay. Any other declarations of interest? No, jolly good. Um, no public questions, I believe. None received, Chairman. So I'm for progress and outcomes and recommendations from the previous meetings. For those of you who are interested, there's a couple of things we do need to chase up that Paul is fully aware of, so they're being chased up. Anything anybody else wants to bring up on pages 15 and 16, please do so. Otherwise, we'll move on. Yeah, we'll just note that. Marvellous. And so on to the exciting bit. Item five, the first mark on the agenda, and it's quite disconcerting seeing a giant Steve Crocker in the room, uh, but I, I don't, I don't mind. I've seen his picture quite a lot over the last few days. Um, 
so school planning places, Peter, if you'd like to. Oh, no, sorry. We're going to start with uh, representations from uh, the head teachers and school governors. So take your time. If you use your microphone and, and let us know your findings. So good evening. It's lovely to be with you. Um, I'm here representing the head teachers that have signed. If you just the, move the mic a little bit closer oh, to you, because as good as they are, they're not brilliant. I've never been asked to have to speak up. My voice is quite loud normally. Um, so I'm here with my colleagues, and we're representing the head teachers that have signed the document that I believe you have received. And we were advised not to just read it out to you, and so we're not going to do that. Um, I'm just going to read uh, three key salient points that we wanted to really reinforce with you um, when considering this really important matter. So our core purpose as head teachers is to ensure that we provide the best possible education for the children in our school now, while striving to provide the same or better for those to come. This purpose stretches beyond the walls of our own schools, as we recognise we are part of the system which shapes the future of our children, and thus our communities and the Isle of Wight. For island education to be the most effective, supporting leadership and collaboration between schools, for the right mix of average to formentary schools and small schools, this mix is needed. Managing places purely by reducing planned admission numbers, we do not believe is an effective strategy because the reduction achieved via this method, method is not sufficient to improve the overall position of overcapacity in school places. It creates smaller schools, which often have to go through prolonged periods of staff restructuring and managing mixed age classes, neither of which are beneficial for the children or for the staff. We believe that we need to act decisively and effectively in planning primary school places, bringing the number of places available in line with the required number of places, so that ultimately island children have the best opportunity to become economically and socially successful citizens in the 21st century as cornerstones of a thriving Isle of Wight community. We are really keen to work with you to logically and strategically pave the way forward together. We believe by doing this, the children will be put first with a shared vision that every child on the Isle of Wight will receive a first class education with an enriching curriculum, personalized and tailored provision that inspires enthusiastic and sorry, inspired by enthusiastic and engaged members of staff. Together as head teachers and counsellors, we would be showing strength, not in satisfying the desire for very small schools in the immediate, but looking into the future and what we want our legacy to be for our children. This evening, it is essential that our message is understood. We do not advocate closing all small schools. I'm a head teacher of two small schools, so I say that with great um, emphasis. However, within an increasing financial, with the increasing financial demands that impact schools of all sizes, we do feel that a strategic approach is essential. As heads, we approach this discussion with some personal trepidation. We understand the implications. However, we believe the strongest outcome for the island children is to work strategically rather than responding individually by reducing pans, by closing classes or schools. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. And just to retake that sign by is it 22 heads, is it? Yes. Yes, thank you. I didn't count, but if it said 22, I think so, yeah. We'll, we'll say 22. Now, if I'm wrong, somebody will correct me. Uh, Simon, did you want to know? 
Thank you, Councillor Quickly. Um, I, I'm, I'm here to represent a group of Chair of Governors who have come together with their head teachers at primary schools to discuss the issue of surplus primary school places. Uh, and thank you to the Chair for allowing Governors to express their concerns about surplus primary school places on the Isle of Wight direct to this committee. And I am grateful for Councillors reading our submission. I've been a Governor for 12 years. I've governed in six schools, five of which are here on the island, um, chaired three of them including my, the current school where I chair at Haylands. I have professional experience of increasing the effectiveness of governing boards and promoting high standards whilst working for the National Governance Association. Our belief as Chair of Governors is that the excess of primary school places on the island prevents children from building the foundations that they will need to compete in an increasingly competitive world. When schools are not full to capacity, they experience financial pressures, which in turn means that compromises have to be made on the quality of education. Surplus places creates a competitive marketplace where primary schools attempt to attract families to their school at the expense of a neighbouring school. The current system motivates governors to strive for a full school in order to improve educational standards, but with such overcapacity in the system, this is unachievable for all. Significantly fewer schools retaining modest PAN numbers would accommodate the total number of primary school children on the island. As well as improving standards and managing resources more efficiently and effectively, there would be less pressure to recruit per school specialists, such as school leaders, special needs coordinators and early years practitioners from a pool of professionals, which is geographically limited. Overcapacity in the system accommodates frequent and multiple school changes by families, which has created a culture across the island in which parents moving their children to a different primary school is an accepted response to inconvenience. For example, um, I have recently become aware of a family that is considering moving school due to a temporary change to their normal walking route to school. Governors are well informed by their head teachers about the detrimental impact on a child moving school mid-year and the disruption to the educational progress of the whole class. Like head teachers, we believe that the council's plan to gradually reduce the pan at primary schools is short term and does not create a system that allows schools to continually improve the educational outcomes and experiences of children. Reducing PANs creates smaller schools, which can inhibit children's social and emotional development. A frequent outcome of reducing a PAN is mixed year group classes, as Maggie said, which every head teacher I have worked with has explained is not optimal for children emotionally or educationally. Repeated reductions in PAN in a school impact on the quality of education and disrupts stability through continual restructuring. And for example, uh, the school where I am currently chair is one of those under pressure to reduce the PAN, which the Governing Board has refused to do because the projected pupil numbers suggest that it would need to be reduced again in only two to three years' time. As, go as Chairs of Governors, we wish to encourage the Council to develop a strategy that addresses the chronic surplus of primary school places for the long term, ensuring that the highest quality education is available in the right place at the right time to the primary age children in our communities. And I would just again like to thank the chair for the invitation to speak this evening and to committee members for your attention. Uh, and if there are any questions, I would welcome those. Thank you. Thank you all actually for attending. So it's very important. I think we as a committee understand uh, the view from the cold place, as it were, not to use that phrase unnecessarily. But I do really think it's really important. And that's I appreciate the brevity with which you put it across, because I imagine there's been quite a lot of work and a lot of hours gone into Get an agreement it was 18 as well head sorry i got carried away there's four four you need to find to make it to 22. um you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting unfortunately you can't take part in the debate but if somebody wants to ask you a direct question then you can you can by all means answer um peter would you like to move on to the next bit thank you chair um so for those of you that don't know me i'm peter cole nutt assistant director um for uh, strategic development and capital delivery Jade's going to support me with the slides this evening. So, Jade, could you put up the first slide, please? As we're working through that, I'll sort of um, try and start if I can then. So um, what we're going to do today is um, I'd like to pick up the key points um, of the uh, report that's in, in front of you today. I'll work on the basis that you've read the report and I'll pick out the um, salient points. There we go. Thank you, Jade. If we just go on to the second slide. So the slide there um, introduces um, my colleagues who are here to um, support and hopefully answer any of your questions 
this evening. They've introduced themselves already, so we won't do that again and perhaps move on to slide three. OK, so um, what we'll do is I'll take you through the key points and then Jade will talk to you about some of the discussions that have taken place, some more detailed discussions that have taken place with our head teacher and governor colleagues and the feedback. And we've heard some of the feedback from the um, deputations. The, the main focus of the report in front of you today talks about the detailed work that's undertaken with our head teacher colleagues so far. And we're happy to pick up any questions that you may have about secondary, perhaps at the end. So the report considers the corporate plan objective, and that covers um, our working with local communities to ensure an appropriate level of school provision. And that a school places plan is in place and maintained and reports on the actions to date and future challenges. So the local authority has a statutory duty to ensure sufficiency of school places. As mentioned, the focus of this report in front of us today is looking at the surplus places, particularly in primary. And in the context of that, the position is a significant reduction in births. And now we're seeing the lowest number of births since 1941. And primary numbers will drop further. And we're showing a further 1,000 places drop between 2017 through to 2025. And at times, the effective management um, of school places includes the need to remove school places as well as build new um, to mitigate um, pressures on schools. But always recognising that the objective will be to provide best outcomes for children, which, as we've heard, um, can have an impact with the impact of surplus places. It's the next slide, Jane. So the management of school places is complex, and for the reasons set out in nine of the report, um, those points are covered. And also, as we've heard this evening, the rural, the rural nature of a number of our schools, and which is also exacerbated by the high number of small schools. But our aim is always to provide, as a local authority, local schools for local children, which are both educationally and financially sustainable in the longer term. And the impact of too many surplus places can have a significant impact on the curriculum delivery as well as school finances. Prior to the summer break, a number of discussions were held with heads and governors to consider options of managing some of the surplus places. And this was done in the context of the cabinet directive that school closures should, school closures should be avoided where possible. And as mentioned in the deputations and other feedback going, that we've received and going forward, many school leaders are seeking more radical solutions to how we manage this challenge. The approach undertaken today is outlined in Appendix A of the report, and Jade will cover that shortly. Next slide, please. So the report also talks to the education white paper that's covered at 20 and 21 and references the government aspirations that all schools will be part of a multi-academy trust, um, or be at least planning to join one by 2030. However, it's important to stress that the school funding regime remains much the same, and it's not expected that this would be a solution to the issue of surplus places. So I'll conclude with the financial section of the report, which is 26 and 27. And that school budgets are largely driven by the number of pupils on roll. And when a school closes, any budget deficit falls to the local authority. Surplus places increase the risk of inefficient schools and increased deficits could impact on the local authority budget. Sponsored academy conversions also result in the deficit falling back to the local authority. Only converter academies have their deficits funded by the incoming trust or DFE. So Chair, if you're happy, I'd now like to hand over to Jade, um, unless there's any specific questions now, who will go through um, the detail of the work that's undertaken with head teachers, and then perhaps we could take questions at the end. Yeah, carry on Jade, we'll Thank do you. questions at the end. So um, I think it's important to note as well, our, our department actively monitors forecast data um, throughout the year as um, census data comes through 
And so, as um, as Pete alluded to, we uh, started a piece of work in around May, June time to look at overall the island as as an area, which which is then broken down to individual planning areas. Um, and from that, what we pulled into to, to the big data set is um, the school's physical capacity, capacity based upon PAN and forecast numbers going through a number of years. And all of that is detailed within the report. Um, and from that piece of work, we then identified which were the highest priority areas, which had the most significant amount of surplus places. And that presentation was then given um, to head teachers and chair of governors meeting. And that summarised um, at that point, what from our from our work, what could we do in terms of reducing places now and going forward um, with with the numbers that we know are coming through. So as part of that that piece of work, we then went through to meet with the individual schools within those planning areas. Um, the planning areas that we we've worked with so far is Ride Town. Sandown and Shanklin and the Ventnor area. Um, and we met then individually with the schools to, to, to put forward our suggestions, which were predominantly around PAM reductions and how that would fit with projected numbers going through. Um, and it is, again, it's important to note that whilst we can propose PAM reductions, it is in conjunction with the governing body to be on board with, with that. Um, so we provided all of the data sets um, and the supporting information that we, we have available to us to the head teachers and governing bodies um, and allowed them to go away and consider that at, at the next governing body meetings. And from that, um, we then had the individual feedback from schools. Um, I won't go through and summarise each individual school, but as a as a high level summary, so you can kind of get a feel for the, the planning areas. Um, within the Sandown and Shanklin area, we asked we we had the discussion with three schools, um, and they were um, broadly Benbridge and the Bay, and they were reducing their number to sit with what we currently see as the forecast number going through, and the. The generalised comments that we had fed back um, were, were obviously highlighted in, within um, your representation, but generally were around the national curriculum is designed for individual class spaces and therefore mixed groups, class sizes is a concern. Um, a number of those are on much larger sites, so mothballing areas it is, is another concern. Um, one of the schools within the area has already reduced their pan and has seen the, the impact of that and sitting on a much larger site. And so at this time, from the feedback that we had from those three schools within the area, none at this time were supportive. Um, some of the feedback we have had from them was that if there is a strategic plan, then it possibly would go back to governors for reconsideration, but that a lot of them wanted to know the wider. Um, view. So, as an overview, if, if those pan reductions were um, to be implemented, it would have left an, it still would have left an 18 percent surplus in 24 25. So, th that, that was our proposal at that time to, to the area. Um, the next area is the Ride Town. Um, Ride is split into two areas for anyone that's not sure it's Ride Town and Ride Rural. And the two schools that um, currently are, have reduced numbers are Greenmount and Haylands Primary School. Both of them are two form entry schools and um, on both in current numbers and going forward, the, the numbers are looking like a pan 45 would, would fit well with the school. And um, Simon, as you are the chair of governors, you will know, um, some of the feedback again was was mimicked the other planning areas around concerns about how is that managed on the two entry site? What is the impacts on um, mixed classes? When would the financial impacts be seen? Working those numbers through. Um, and so at this time, both of those schools were not, were not supportive, but again, have the view that there is a wide strategic plan 
then um, it would be reconsidered at that time in terms of going forward. Um, and the final area was the Ventnor planning area, which is a, is a tricky area because of the sporadic nature of um, the, the schools, and they are rural, a number of them. Um, but it does have the highest number of surplus places. And so finding um, a solution for that area was tricky other than you know, looking at the individual schools and their numbers going forward. So the schools within that are God's Hill, Knighton and Roxall. Um, God's Hill was already one of the schools that was considering a pound reduction. They have a pound currently of 27 and we're considering reducing to 20 because it fits that nicely with both their building and their configuration of classes. So um, that's one that we are going to be taking forward and that will be included within the admissions um, consultation that, that will start for this year, but it won't come into play until 2024. Um, and so the other two schools were Roxall Primary School and Knighton, which um, they both at this time are not supportive. Roxall's numbers um, have seen a slight increase over the summer, and so I think they were slightly resistant to see what numbers do, um, but didn't see any massive benefit in reducing PAN at this time. Even with making those PAN reductions in that area, it would still leave. Um, if we were to implement them, it would still leave a 38% surplus um, in that planning area. So there would still be further work to do in, in those in those schools. Um, and that, that's, that's a generic summary of the work that we've done today. Um, in terms of the next steps, we'll continue to work with schools that propose pound reductions and they'll be included within our normal admissions um, consultation and uh, which we have to consult on from the 1st of October to the 31st of January and, um, and work with other schools that, that are already on that journey to reducing numbers. There are some that I haven't mentioned within that because they don't sit within those planning areas, but it is an active bit of work that we do as a you know, normal business. That's the summary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I will open up to questions. I'm looking at some stunned faces. I don't know if it's stunned or just the amount of information because I was very sorry. Thank you. Uh, any questions for anybody that's spoken so far? Councillor Outlaw. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I know part of the role of a policy and scrutiny committee for those who may not have uh, uh, been to these uh, committees before is to be a critical friend to the administration in helping them form policy. And uh, I'm afraid, Chair, I'm going to have to break that rule of being a critical friend on this one because never, I've been a council of five years um, and I've never been more depressed reading a, a paper than I have reading this one. I found myself highlighting the bits that concern me in the paper but actually, it would have been easier to highlight the bits that didn't concern me in the paper because it all did. And some of it, <laughs> I could have chosen a different colour to highlight because they were, it's, it's just generally dreadful. And I'd like to thank the officers who have been involved in the work for trying to resolve this um, uh, because you've clearly gone out of your way to try and find solutions to this problem. But I'm reminded of uh, quite a, many years ago, uh, a cabinet member, uh, Jeff, um, Jeffrey Howe, who resigned in Parliament, and in his speech he said uh, he felt like he was going into bat uh, for his team, only to find that when he got to the crease, that his bat had been broken by the captain. And that's what I think this, the cabinet, the Isle of Wight cabinet is doing over this issue of PANS. You, when read, reading the paper, it's clear you've gone in with a remit, which is there won't be any school closures. That simply ties, the, ties your officers' hands straight away. And without addressing that, 
there is not going to be a solution to this. I'm, I'm the councillor for Lake North, uh, broadly is in my uh, ward, and I see in two years' time they're going to have a 51% surplus. But we simply can't pussyfoot around this issue. It needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed by the cabinet, I'm afraid. Now, I, I'm pleased that you're here uh, as the cabinet member, Debbie. I know you would be, and I know you care genuinely about the education of these children. And I'm very disappointed to see that none of your fellow cabinet members are here to support you and back you up because they're leaving you out in the lurch. It's supporting this policy, of not dealing with this by addressing the reality that some schools will have to close is wrong. And I, I want this committee to register that because you've heard from the governors, you've heard from the teachers that this, this is not a solution. And reading between the lines, I can see that the officers don't support this policy. And it worries me that Hampshire, Hampshire will turn around to, to the Isle of Wight and say, if the Isle of Wight Council are not going to help themselves, why should we help them? You know, I worry about the partnership because the Isle of Wight needs the partnership with Hampshire. I know from being a cabinet member myself and dealing with uh, the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service and combination with Hampshire. That, I knew that that wasn't necessarily going to be popular with everyone, but it was right for the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service. It was right for the Isle of Wight community. And addressing the reality that schools sometimes have to close is right for the education of the Isle of Wight children. And without putting you on the spot, Debbie, I really desperately need you to understand that political expediency and promises that were made at an election, they mean nothing when you're talking about children's education and doing what's right for those pupils. Uh, thank you, Councillor Outlaw. I, I just made before I come to you, Councillor Andre, is, um, this is very clear, this needs working on together. This is this affects the current, the next and the one after that administration by the looks of things. And this is education outcomes are talking about, not political ones. And this is going to be difficult for all to get our heads around this. But it is a real opportunity. But reorganisation of schools isn't easy because it's very emotive. You're dealing with children, you're dealing with people's futures, you're dealing with parents. But it's one that we all need to work together on. So I, I, I thank, thank you for what you said, Councillor Outlaw, but it goes across all the chamber. I think it's very... I think it's essential that we realise that all 39 of us need to work on this, uh, along with the officers and, and the teachers and, and governors. Councillor Andre. Thank you. In response to that, I'd like to thank Councillor Outlaw. I know how hard you worked, Teg, as a Cabinet member, and I know that you do have a deep understanding, and I do have a deep respect for you. I'm I think it's, it's fabulous, to be honest, or maybe that's not the right word, that we have representatives, head teachers association, governors, school, school leaders from the Church of England, that, as the chair said, this is something that we do all need to work together. But I'd just like to refer back to what you said at the beginning, okay. sorry, Councillor Outlaw, the, the role of this committee is to, yes, to be a critical friend. Yes, it is very emotive, but let's all work together on this. And what would be really helpful here is to actually come forward with some positive recommendations, which I am very happy to take on board and take back to my cabinet. Thank you. Any other questions? or comments. I think it's probably that much information that uh, <laughs> need a bit of time. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask, um, I mean, as all's already been said, you know, the, the key point here is what's going to be best for the children um, and their education outcomes and the ability to school, for schools to be able to deliver that, that to, a, to a high quality. Um, <clears throat> 
So I'm seeking reassurance, really, that the council are going to give due consideration to all the points raised by very experienced professionals and, and governors across a whole number of concerns that simply reducing pans could lead to. And I share many of those concerns. Um, and just to add some of the things that were said, you know, the impact on, on the morale of the teaching profession on the island, the effect that that could have on staffing and recruitment, and the sort of downward spiral that those sort of things can lead to if, you know, it's not good. Um, so, could you just please explain why you believe a strategy of simply reducing PAN will lead to a continuation and improvement in standards in schools on the island, please? Thank you for that, Rob. Let's just be clear here. This is part of the process. This is not the whole process. This is the school planning, places planning. I'm so grateful for the submissions that we've had in. I can say, yes, we will definitely be listening to everything that's been said. And in fact, I have made some notes from earlier that I will take back to, to, uh, to Cabinet. Some really important points have come through that we need to, and I'm sure we're all on the same page with this, that we need to deliver the best possible education both now and either the same or better to come. We all agree with that. The pan reductions are not effect, an effective solution. They are not, they are not a, a long-term solution. They are not a solution in themselves. There is no quick fix. There is no one solution to this. So we have to look at, and that's where the, the strategic view comes in to a, a range of solutions. We need to logically and strategically pave the way forward. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> but I, I was really, really moved by what you said. Really agree with that. And, and finally, a strategic approach is essential. Absolutely. And as I would say, this is the start of that process. I am, I am listening to what is being said. This is, this is not cast in stone. This is, this, there are very difficult decisions and choices to be made. But what I am looking for from this committee tonight is for some recommendations coming out of this paper that I can take back to Cabinet. And even I am willing to take the paper itself to Cabinet if that's what this committee would want. Thank you. Thank you. So could we actually just make a recommendation that do you take this report back to Cabinet uh, and seek to, in conjunction with school leaders and officers, come back with several options that, uh, that will find a suitable solution? So I think that would make it actionable. Do I have someone to second that? Thank you, Councillor Oliver. Well, loads of you, everybody. Fantastic. Uh, anything else? Any other questions or any other statements before we move on? Oh, yes, we want to take a vote on, on that we agree with that as a recommendation. Those are you allowed to vote. Those in favour? If you could show clearly, Chairman. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six. Any against? Any abstentions? You can vote if you want to. Thank you. There we go. Smashing. Uh, anything else on that point before we move on? Right. Yes. Sorry. Just to mention that obviously as councillors, we're given lots of documents, lots of policies, and we're looking at this in amongst all of our other policies, whether it's transport policies, environmental policies, and it's trying to bring them all together to find the best solutions for our area. And I'm in a very rural area and I've seen lots of schools close in our area and we don't want to see any more schools close because that affects us in other ways. So I'm really keen to find new options to make this work because I don't want to keep seeing less children in our schools. It's, it's upsetting, like Councillor Outlaw was saying, it's, it's depressing reading these figures. So there's got to be a better way. So I want to see a better way of doing it. And I don't want to see any more schools close because I think we're just going to keep closing schools and where do we end? It's, you know, there's got to be better ways of making education work in our communities. So I'm glad it's going forward to Cabinet so that we can explore that. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 just as a word of warning, I don't think you're going to get the answer you want. I think, as we can see, as, as, a, as my own conclusion, is that the pressure on primary schools over the next few years is going to be fantastic in every single way. And unless we come up with a plan for introducing another 400 
primary school kids to the island, which everyone seems to oppose building new houses. So that's a conundrum for us as councillors as well. I don't see an answer. So, so I appreciate the point you're making, Councillor Christensen, but I think we've got to get away from rainbow endings and be a little bit serious about what we do in the future. Um, and bear in mind as well, you've also got a, a, a panel of expertise over here that will come to you with options. We just need to engage. You know, it's, we, we, we don't have to do the how, we just need to ask the what, and then the experts will tell us how. So, so don't get too bogged down with this bit being just entirely down to you. So thank you. So anything else or, or should we move on? Let's move on. Uh, you, oh, sir, yes. Me? If, if you if you don't, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't want to stay for another <laughs> hour or so, but uh, thank you so much for attending. It really is appreciated. I think it's accelerated that uh, discussion quite significantly. Yeah. And if the, 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 if the chamber, James and sorry, I forgot your name already. If you want to move forward, so you sort of part of the group, if you want to. Because it's, I presume you're presenting this part. If you if you don't mind introducing it, then that'd be great. So I'll let you I'll let you get you comfortable again. So if you turn your microphone on, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to warm up. So if you give it a little press, oh no, it's straight away. So yeah, so thank you. That we kept pretty much the time on that item. So moving on to item six, children's services annual report on complaints and representations. Suzanne, over to you. Thank you. So this is an annual report that we bring to this committee. Um, we're, we're required as part of our statutory duties to reflect um, and produce a public report every year on the complaints, primarily around statutory social care complaints. Um, but actually what we've done in this report is we've put across all the complaints into the department. So those that come through around other services as well as those around social care. I'll let Colin and James talk to the detail, but just a few things just to bear in mind in terms of the context of the report. Covers the period, um, we had a, a couple of lockdowns, um, lots of you know, staff, staff sickness issues, quite difficult to investigate complaints um, in, in that kind of period. So actually, I think the performance in respect of timeliness and resolutions in that context is, is positive. I um, just want to highlight that there are different types of complaints, so we call a corporate complaint something that is about a non-social care uh, complaint, so it might be the SEN service, it could be about homeschool transport, it could be about a particular service provision, but they're referred to as corporate complaints, um, and then we have our statutory social care complaints, and we treat those slightly differently um, as, as required by statutory guidance. Um, and, and within that, we have different timescales within which we have to respond and investigate in different stages. So uh, the report has all of that detail in it. Um, I don't propose we go through all of it. I'm sure you have read every single word and looked at all the different graphs, but I'll leave it to Colin and Jane to just draw out a few of the highlights for you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Colin Payne. I'm the Head of Information Governance and Business Support um, at Hampshire County Council, uh, of which the children's social care complaints process falls under my area's responsibility. Um, Suzanne's absolutely right. The annual complaints report is a statutory duty. It's something that is set out you know, in statutory guidance that we have to produce. But I think it's really important to look at complaints as normal. You know, it's something that every council, every organisation receives. And it's more important about focusing on them as a learning tool. You know, how can we learn from them? How can we use them to help uh, produce service improvement? And that's partly what the, the um, report helps to do in terms of bringing that information together. We do produce this uh, year on year, and this time it is the first uh, report that includes kind of the whole picture, so both children's social care complaints and uh, the corporate complaints element. So in terms of within the report, there is some comparison data, but that is all focused on children's social care because we don't obviously have previous years to compare to in terms of that aspect. And our thanks goes out to the um, business services support team uh, here on the island to help you pull together the uh, corporate complaints data for this information. We had as a total 83 representations during the reporting period, which covered um, 1st of April 2021 through to the 31st of March 2022. Uh, within that, 36 of those were around children's social com care complaints, 
16 were under the corporate complaints uh, element, and there were 31 that are under the other representations. And those are broken down in the report in more detail, so you can see the specific elements. The report has seen uh, a number of consistent outcomes that we would expect to see uh, compared to previous reports. So parents continue to be the most likely group to make uh, a complaint at 70 percent. Um, that we the highest category, the main reason why complaints are made continues to be uh, the conduct of worker uh, as, as a category. Um, as well as the fact that the majority of the complaints in terms of service focus uh, for children's social care are around caste teams. But those are all outcomes we would expect to see and are consistent with um, the results that we see in Hampshire as well, you know, across the social care service area. But we have seen positives as well in terms of changes within the report. Uh, so, for example, in terms of children's social care complaints responded to within 10 working days at stage one, uh, that was up to 41% in this reporting period uh, compared to 31% uh, in the last uh, last period. So there's that positive movement in terms of uh, complaints being responded to in a more timely manner. Um, we've also seen uh, the number of complaints escalating from stage one to stage two through that statute uh, process also reducing which um, can be seen as, uh, as a positive outcome of work that the services have been doing um, to try and improve the quality of response at stage one. Because as they go through the stages, it's a more intensive process, it's a more costly process in terms of the need for independent persons to be brought in. You know, so the more work that can be done to resolve that, firstly, for the complainants themselves and the children, to, you know, to try and uh, get the best outcome, but also as we look at it from a financial point of view in terms of trying not to increase spend that it could be dealt with at an earlier stage. In terms of the recommendations within the report, we focused um, in, in uh, the recommendations this time very much around the financial resilience and service improvement uh, aspects that we needed to bring into the service. The challenges that we faced in terms of increasing numbers of complaints, um, losing some key members of staff. Um, uh, at, we lost our long serving complaints manager uh, and our longest serving complaints officer, which you know you lose that expertise has an impact, but we've successfully recruited and James as complaints manager is here today, um, as well as uh, recruiting to those staff. But we've looked to also future proof the service and challenge that financial resilience to say, actually, we're seeing year on year increases how are we going to uh, ensure that the service is future-proofed moving forward? And therefore, in turn, also looking at how individual service improvement can be put in place. So I mentioned about the um, quality of responses at uh, stage one and how they responded to. And you know, are there new ways of working with those services, helping them to understand sort of process and techniques, good practice that might stop those escalations from stage one to stage two? But then again, from stage two to stage three, which, you know, again, adds additional costs, timescales and draws out those issues you know, for the complainant. So what I'm actually going to do is pass over to James, who's going to provide sort of an overview of that activity that's ongoing and the planned action to put those service improvements into place. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I've been in this role for just over six months now. Um, so the top priority when I came in, it was very clear, was to... Um, acknowledge that there is room for improvement in terms of the timeliness of our stage two complaints um, and to, to be better at that. So that was my top priority and we've done some steps already and we continue to do more. So to start with on a positive, the, the quality of our work is has not been criticised at any point in terms of anything gone to the Ombudsman um, and things like that, that the quality of the work and the outcomes have not been criticised. What, what, what there's room for improvement on is, is the timeliness of that. Now I'm sure everyone here has made a complaint in the past we all know that the speed of the response and the timeliness of that response is a really big factor in how we find that resolution and whether it's good enough. So we, that's where the report acknowledges we need to be better. So what we've done firstly, um, as Colin mentioned, is, is increase our resilience within the team, um, specifically within the service. And what that allows us to do is when a complaint comes in, it allows us to make sure that we're appropriately pushing it down the right route. Like Suzanne said, there are many different places it can go. So we're doing that with now within 24 hours, whereas previously it was three days. 
And what that gives is the service the best possible opportunity to respond to that within the time frame um, that we're given, and also hopefully um, give the complainant a, a better resolution in a, in a more timely manner as well. Um, with that extra capacity as well, um, I've been able to embed and continue to be better at everything that's important in, in uh, modern day business, which is things like continuous improvement and, and all that sort of cultural things that I think we maybe haven't done in the past few years. So we can get better every day, even if it is in small increments. Um, one of the requirements of stage two is to have uh, someone fulfill the role of investigating officer. Um, and that is essentially an independent individual to the service. So they're still recruited by the council, but they're independent of the service. And we had a very small pool of people we could call upon. Um, their senior managers. I spent a lot of time over the last few months training senior managers in the process so that there's more people to call upon. That in itself is a, is a good win. And we also are required to have independent persons. They are entirely independent of the council and we can call upon much more people now because I've gone through a bigger recruitment drive. Um, we, we've increased by, um, you know, we're talking sort of doubling numbers of investigating officers um, and very similar in terms of the IPs as well. So really big increases. More people can do more complaints, quite simply put. The longer term plan, however, is not to rely on senior managers to fulfill that role. They have busy jobs, they have other things to do, that we're taking them away from other things in order to do these complaints. So what we're doing as part of our resilience is actually recruiting to those posts internally. So I personally will line manage two investigating officers. They will do this role full time and that's all they will do. Now that's a benefit because from a very, very kind of typical resource point of view, we're not calling on senior managers to step away from their important posts, but we've also got subject matter experts now who know this process, they know what is quite a complicated statutory framework, they know it very well, and they're able to apply their own knowledge to that and, and make sure the complaint is dealt with properly as well, which is just a, a benefit. Um, and then finally, Colin touched upon making our stage one slightly better in, in sense of not escalating to stage two. Um, and we've got a whole host of things, which I won't go through everything for you right now, but can follow up if you've got any questions. But it's, it's very simple things like training our managers in, in how to handle com complaints and difficult conversations, positive um, problem-free talking, all these things might mean something to you if you've been in customer service in the past. Um, but also, we're very keen to write letters and um, baseless correspondence in the past, is something I would suggest. We're picking up the phone now, we're talking to people, we're creating, we're starting dialogue, and that's been received really positively in the past few months as well, and we're just going to keep building on that. So that's just one example of it. Um, but again, it's like I said, happy to go through more if, if you've got any questions. And the final thing I'll just say is we've worked really closely with our um, transformation um, practice colleagues in, in just being more efficient. So writing things like templates that it's not a fun thing to talk about, but we've got our templated emails, we've got um, all of our really um, clear um, uh, automated processes now, not manual ones. And that's not interesting to talk about, but it again, just makes us more efficient, makes us quicker, and it means we can really rely, we can focus on the people that are complaining and talking to people as well. So hopefully that gives you a little insight into what we're doing to be better. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Uh, some people here love a good template, so don't undersell, don't undersell <laughs> that. Um, any questions? Councillor Christensen. Sorry. Sorry. This is one. Typically, Max. Uh, thank you for that. I, I'm really pleased that you're looking at the training needs and the focusing on that. I think that's really key to having a good team and having good outcomes. So are you expecting the representations you're getting to sort of go back to pre-COVID kind of numbers on, on there? We forecasted our resilience model based on the current trend of, of growth to ensure that if they were to continue, we, we can meet that demand. Obviously, what we don't want to do is then face those pressures um, uh, within that. Current uh, current numbers coming through seem to imply that they're not dropping, that the, that the growth is to, is continuing. Um, I think possibly changing working patterns, the way people maybe are at, you know, hybrid working, flexible working at home, creates a dynamic that enables someone, uh, kind of the environment to make the complaint that they, they want to make that maybe if they've been in an office environment or traveling, might have taken taken that away. So I think current, you know, that cultural situation as a result of the pandemic, I think has changed uh, the opportunity for people to continue to make complaints in, in that way. If I may, sorry, just to say as well, I'm really, my statutory role, one of them is to um, make sure we learn lessons and we, we prevent complaints as well. And that's something I've 
I haven't mentioned in here, but I'm taking really seriously as well. So where Colin's absolutely right, the trends are pointing in that direction, but are there lessons within that? So are there trends, are there repeat themes, things like that? That's something that me and the team are really going to pick up on as well. So hopefully that might help produce. But again, like Colin says, we're forecasting for good ideas. Just gonna take care. I mean, the, the nature of the work we do means that we will always get complaints of some type. We can't always meet um, everybody's kind of desires and wants and people don't always welcome our involvement in, in their lives. So there will always be a level of complaint. I think, the, as James has said, the focus for us is about when we get those complaints, are we really effective at dealing with them? Are we preventing escalation by being really clear and helping people to understand um, why something happened in the way it did or why we took the steps that we did um, and then picking up on anything thematic because that's where I think we need to really focus. If we keep getting complaints about the same things that we can do something about, that's where we've really got to learn. Yeah, sorry, can I just, just follow yeah. up on that? Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just that if we're finding recurring needs, then obviously there is a changing dynamic out there and I'd just like us to be able to move with that and hope that we're helping people deal with those because obviously if they are finding that their environment has changed and it is, is making that really a difficult workplace and learning place for children then it's yeah so hopefully we're on top of it thank you um, um you know some very good work being done uh, but steve knows the question that's coming next he's dealt with me long enough now is that uh, the good stuff's great but tell us the bad stuff so where are the banana skins if you had a magic wand what do you want to happen next I think actually the, the, the action plan is looking to sort of tackle those aspects and be really positive. And I think what's also worth mentioning is actually the engagement that's coming back from the service. You know, you sometimes worry as a complaint service, you might be seen as policing and chasing, but actually there's a real positive response from the service that they want to learn. They want to, to find ways of doing it. They're really working with us to try and bring those, those improvements in. So, uh, you know, the, the challenge has been the stage two aspects, but the fact that we've increased capacity, we're looking at the service dynamics to try and stop the escalations from stage one, one to two, that actually we, we already kind of identify and trying to tackle the, the banana skins as you, as you put to it. So um, I think actually it's, it's, a, it's a positive experience in terms of that engagement and change. And, and you know, we're, we're now hopefully start to see, you know, that sort of flow through flow through the system. One of the things we've done, um, certainly since James joined, but more more closely in recent in the re recent year, is pull together the Hampshire and Isle of Wight teams much more closely. And what that's enabled us to do is, is make those resources go further. So James talked about the um, dedicated investigating officers. Things like that aren't are difficult if, if you're not sharing across the authorities. But um, actually, I think that you know, stage two is a definite ask. And, James was very clear about what I needed him to do when he arrived, and he's doing a great job at getting through that. Um, but bringing those teams closer also means that we can share the learning. So actually, if we're seeing spotting a trend um, in Hampshire, you know, perhaps around EHCPs or placements, we can think about how we're responding to that and, and take that learning immediately over to the island and say, how do we prevent that from happening over here? What are the things that we can do and put in place? Makes sense. Sounds good work. Well done. Well done, you. Councillor Outlaw. Uh, yeah, a bit of clarity for me, if you don't mind. It was it was quite clear uh, from what you said about how you're going about increasing the pool of investigating officers, but I'm curious about uh, the independent persons. Who, who and how do you get those? It's a good question. Um, so the statutory guidance says that an independent person should um, write a report at the end of stage two, and that report should... Um, give a perspective on whether the investigation was open, fair and transparent. That is their requirement. Um, some will do that with one side of A4, some will um, write more words. I'm sure we all know our colleagues that are like that. And um, what we do is we, we make sure that they are independent and not recruited by the, the council directly. So we have uh, Connect to Hampshire, those of you who know it, um, or an agency, and we essentially will go to Connect to Hampshire and, and pay them for, for the services of an individual. Now, what that will happen is we, we will recruit like, like traditionally with any role. Um, we'll say what the job habit is and the kind of experience we're looking for. Now, to give you an idea of the people on our books, we've got um, a whole, whole range of people. We have people who maybe have worked for the authority in the past, but maybe decades ago, so they've got social work experience. 
we've got police officers. Um, one person I've recently employed, he chairs a lot of safeguarding panels at the moment um, for, for children and young people, so he's got really experience in that. I've got um, people with law degrees um, and um, other individuals who, like I say, have got social work from other councils and other authorities. So what, what we're able to do is, is look at the complaint and, and assign it to an individual who's going to offer a perspective that means that they can say it's open and fair, but also provide a professional opinion as well, which is really insightful for that, for that investigation. Um, and ultimately, we can have as many people on our books as, as we want we only pay them for the services they provide. So there's no um, kind of negatives to having lots of people on our books. And I continue to increase that pool for that reason. Any other questions? No, uh, I'd just say, Suzanne, well done. What a good team. And I, I reserve the right to change your mind in a year's time if you're not <laughs> performing. Uh, but to both Colin and James, it's really encouraging. I know this isn't my job to, to blow smoke as it were, but it's very encouraging to see you come along with, uh, totally on top of your brief and thoroughly engaged in what you're doing. And I don't think any questions we'd have answered tonight would have put you out off your stride. So well well done and, and, and keep it up. So moving on, let's see if we can keep that up. Who's who's doing item seven, the white paper? Natalie, pressure's on. I'm sure who's doing them. Who's doing the slides? I think we yeah, reading through the agenda back, Natalie. If you, if you crack on, we'll we'll keep up, honestly. I'll make the noise as if the slides appeared. Does that help? Yeah. Bing. If you do your microphone, Natalie, if you would, thank you. It was you. produced in March. Um, and of course, we've had significant political turmoil since. So what will actually happen with that which is within the white paper is uncertain. However, fair chunks of it have already started. So there's a lot to talk about within its contents anyway. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that the green paper um, published in parallel kind of rubs up against it to an extent, and Jane will be talking to you about that, because the ambitions of the two papers um, push school leaders in very different directions. So helping to make sense of that within the school system as far as we can is something that we're working very hard on. So the white paper's ambitions are around achieving academic targets for young people. They would um, aspire to 90% of primary age children reaching age-related expectations in reading, writing and maths. And what is also interesting is that um, the origin of the current tests was actually a government directive to ask for a papers, examination papers to be produced for children that meant that only 65% of them passed. So we're in a situation where um, the original targets were, were set by the hardness of the papers. We're also in a situation where we are recovering from a pandemic. And although the SATS results this year are not going to be published nationally, you'll probably have picked up from the news that there has been un, you know, a, a huge decline and that isn't unexpected because there's been such turmoil and turbulence in teaching. So it's an interesting target. And I think it's probably worth reflecting on the means of getting more children to a better place in education rather than that number itself. I think the GCSE one is interesting as well, because what we've just witnessed is a whole scale moving of grade boundaries to be halfway back towards the 2019 grade boundaries. Um, and that has resulted in, as you'll have heard in the news, kind of a, a shifting down of grades. So putting a target of an increasing grade in a white paper, when at the same time it's being clearly demonstrated that you can move those grade boundaries around, depending on where you want the results to sit, is also interesting. Um, so the way that the white paper outlines the achievement of these targets is firstly that 500,000 teacher training opportunities become available by 2024. Most of those, most of the things to support those are already happening. Most of the schools on the island sign work with us on the ECT programmes, which support teachers in the second stages of their careers. Um, there are teacher training places and 
enhanced programmes for supporting people as they, they start on their careers, which are currently being reviewed and amended. So that, that is already happening. Specialist training to drive literacy improvements, that hasn't yet happened, um, but we hope that it will, because although we're very focused on improving literacy across schools, any funding to focus that will be very welcome. And new qualification for leading literacy, um, again, if that comes and enhances the focus on it, that will be very welcome. The 30,000 starting salary has come into play and it's causing pretty tricky situations with, with school, school budgets. Um, it also begs the question of, of progression, what happens after that? And also, what about the teachers in the system that haven't yet reached that, but have been teaching for a number of years? So there's lots of things in there that make it quite difficult. And it's also important to note with that, that the main reason that teachers give for leading, leaving the profession after a couple of years isn't salary. It's to do with workload, it's to do with job satisfaction. So that is there, it is being enacted, but whether it will drive the required sustained recruitment has yet to be seen. In terms of improving teaching as well, uh, the Oak Academy was funded during lockdown to produce um, lessons which people could tap into, schools could use and um, it meant that they didn't have to produce their own resources in a number of cases. Uh, at this point, Brian, who's a previous primary school teacher, talks about the joy of planning his lessons for his primary school children. I'm an ex-secondary school teacher. I would say from my perspective, um, you would dip into something like that to suit perhaps the needs of your, your children. But I have never, as a secondary school teacher, taught anything straight from a pre-planned curriculum. It just doesn't work. Um, in fact, some of the contributors to Oak Academy have recently pulled out for that reason. They, they understand very clearly that a, a national curriculum by resource is not something that is going to move children forward educationally. So although there are some good parts in that, I think that the direction that it's going, um, I'm glad it, it's been wobbled slightly because I think that we need to keep teachers understanding that they plan for the children in front of them rather than picking something up and delivering it. The longer average mainstream school week, 32 and a half hours minimum. Most schools do that anyway. Uh, most schools that don't do it are thinking about how they do it. Uh, it's, it's slightly tricky because most schools reduce down to make break times more manageable and they are reducing back up by making break times longer because in this sad state of school funding, it's cheaper to employ more lunchtime supervisors than it is to employ the extra teachers that you'd need to expand the lessons. So that's one of the ones which has a brave and noble aim at its heart, but it's tricky to see if that aim is actually going to be, be realised. Um, but then the support to schools to improve attendance, and a lot has come through about that, and we're doing a lot of work on that. And that's something that I don't think anyone has any doubt at all about working towards and the importance of it. Uh, we know that over the pandemic, in particular, the number of children that were at home for more than half of the time uh, increased dramatically. When children aren't attending school for more than half of the time, their education is, is all but lost to them. It becomes very, very difficult to get them back on track and attaining. So getting those children back into school and learning is a huge priority. And the resources produced by the DfE, albeit with no funding, and the direction around that so far is something that we've been able to really pick up and work with across all of our teams. So linking together social care, inclusion, school improvement. So that, that's one which, which we are really enjoying ploughing forward with and we still re see real benefits of. There's also behaviour guidance being released. The behaviour guidance rubs a little against the attendance guidance because the behaviour guidance is more draconian. Um, it, it moves towards exclusions as a form of punishment really quite easily. And of course, if you exclude a child, they're not in school and that cycle starts again. So we're dealing with that with more caution um, and interpreting it kind of with thought with leaders. But it is something that is um, you know, close to the hearts of leaders as children come back from the pandemic because the regulation uh, has dropped off and some of them are needing considerable support to get back into the habit of learning and being part of a class. 
In terms of additional support for some children, um, there's a parent pledge in there. Uh, I think that every school I've ever visited or talked with on the Isle of Wight already has in place significant contact between parents and teachers. Parents evening is the most usual format of that. So I think that the parent pledge really is, it's, it's something which looks nice, but the reality is, is that most schools are doing it and more. Uh, the tutoring courses up to 6 million by 2024. Uh, the DfE has released the responsibility and the money to schools for arranging their own tutoring from a much more centrally based approach and schools really welcome that. The rub with that at the moment is lack of tutors and quality of tutors. So schools have got the money, they desperately want tutors, they know that they're going to be judged to some extent on how much they've taken this up, but they're finding that the quality is poor and they are not happy with allowing poor quality to um, you know, work with their children because they don't feel that it will produce the desired results. So there's a bit of a, a rub there too. Securing funding for the Education Endowment Foundation. We use their resources a lot. Many school users use their resources a lot. They are excellent. So that funding is very welcome. And the establishment of a register for children not in school is also very welcome. And the Isle of Wight is particularly good at knowing where those children are and engaging with the parents of those children. Uh, so the picture here is very positive, but the register is, a, is an additional safeguard really. And the Isle of Wight is a leader in this. So there's many other places which are much further behind and there are children which really nobody knows where they are. So doing something about that is, is a really positive step forward in terms of, of keeping all children safe and educated. So the final, the final part of this is about system-wide reform. And the current government is, is very clear that they believe that being part of a multi-academy trust uh, is what schools need to, to be, to be successful. Um, actually, on the Isle of Wight, it feels like the schools are part of a multi-academy trust because the benefits which the DfE talk of around becoming part of a multi-academy trust, so the sharing of staff and the collaboration, they all happen really well anyway. So that's a, a comfort, is that that part of their ambition, which is true, is something that the Isle of Wight is already on the front foot with. Um, in terms of the, the governance changes required to join a, a multi-academy trust, it's quite complex. It, it takes away from um, the school improvement agenda. So the timings around the thinking about this are things that I, I urge people to think about very, very carefully. And there's lots of um, NGA publications that, that talk people through it in great detail. Um, so there was an initial, I think, flurry of concern about this, but actually, it's the plan to have a multi-academy trust by 2030. There's no stick around it. We don't know what's going to happen politically. And we've kind of checked that we are ensuring that schools have access to the things that the government's ambition for them to be provided with through joining multi-academy trust is there. So we've done, done, done due diligence around that part of it, really. Uh, there's the strong local authorities to, permitted to set up multi-academy trusts and of course we're talking you know, to them about that and looking at the possibilities and strengthening the powers of local authorities um, in the areas of place planning admissions in particular is very useful because having a mixed economy of maintained schools and, and academies where academies controlled admissions sometimes made placement of children particularly vulnerable ones very tricky so that's very, very welcome. Uh, in terms of education investment areas, the Isle of Wight is one, but it's not one of the um, selected ones to get the additional funding. Uh, the two main things around that, one is the pledge around sixth forms in education investment areas which don't have good sixth form provision. And the Isle of Wight only has good sixth form provision. There's no sixth form provider on the island that isn't rated good by Ofsted. And there's also a range. There are um, academic and vocational options available for sixth formers for post-16 young people. So that that is not part of that that's going to, um, I think, be, be a priority on the island. And the other thing which I think or I hope will benefit the island is the increased funding for some of the specialist teachers. So I think that's that's where the island will see the benefit of that. 
Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. We really don't know. We know what started. We know what's in, in train, but we don't know what will start of that which hasn't started. Um, but I think that the comforting thing is that when we've looked through it, we've made sure that we have started anyway the things that are of benefit. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Adams. Sorry. Uh, I have reservations. Uh, I know it's a government position to drive these multi academy trusts, but I've read over the years that not all of these are successful and quite a few of them fell. Aren't we saying by this that we have no faith in our local authority schools? Because it concerns me that we're trying to close them down, but I believe many of the smaller schools on the island have a future. And I think we need that debate earlier, obviously with reducing the numbers. I'm open to that. I'd stain from the vote because I don't have enough knowledge on it. But I'm not so sure that this multi-academy trust is the way forward. Is it just a financial thing from the government? Um, I, I think it's a political thing. The finances of maintained schools and schools that are in trusts are, are not different. I think that they hope that schools will collaborate. I think that's that's behind it. Um, but actually, Isle of Wight schools collaborate very well. They have to because they are small schools. And as you've seen, they also collaborate well as leaders um, because they practice that over time. So it's very important that if governing bodies are thinking about perhaps joining a multi-academy trust, they think it through very carefully and they look at the evidence, such as you said, not all multi-academy trusts do well for their children. Um, and most important of all, to look at what they already have, because the Isle of Wight has a school improvement service and it has a lot of um, resource available to it, which perhaps isn't available in other local authorities, the thinking I think needs to be very clear around that. Whereas if you were in a different local authority without that resource, you might um, think differently about the whole idea of joining a multi-academy trust. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions, Natalie? Yes, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one question related to what we were discussing earlier about place planning, and you've mentioned in the slide there about strengthening powers and, and so on. Just theoretically speaking, if, if say, all schools wholesale on the island decided to join multi-academy trusts and there were two or three trusts that all schools were part of, and the trust was to say, right, well, we've been running these schools now for a couple of years and this one isn't viable, it's too small, we're going to close it. Can they do that? Or can the local authority step in because you've got place planning powers? Or how does it work in terms of a multi-academy trust closing schools? Well, we know from Western Academy that multi-academy trusts can um, ask for schools to be closed at very short notice and it does become much easier to close schools, especially when there are surplus places when schools are not maintained schools. But can the local authority step in to prevent that if the place planning is a concern? I, I think I think that they they can't. Okay. So that has quite an implication for the island then in terms of schools academising potentially. If if all of the schools on it, it's yeah. But no veto or anything like that. We couldn't. We would work with the RLC and it's about what to be a Steve, did you want to come in on that? I was really struggling. Can you hear me, first of all? Uh, we not... can hear you. Yeah, oh, great. OK, I was really struggling to hear some of that. But um, ironically, I'm currently at Sanctuary Buildings, the DfE headquarters, uh, where for my sins, I've been discussing this this topic. Um, and I think you have to remember the ambition and it it's a, a political ambition is is for um, all schools to be part of a multi-academy trust by the year 2030. So it's eight years away. Um, but as it currently stands, uh, you're right in that the, um, uh, the multi-academy trust uh, could could take that action. And we uh, people might want to cast their mind back to um, 
uh, the adventures of AET and Sandown Bay. And we had to take some quite innovative action uh, because there was there was a, um, uh, a a sufficiency issue there, and whilst it made you know on AET's map in London, it didn't look far from Sandown to they they said to ride. Actually, it's a bit further than uh, that might have appeared in terms of travel time, and it wasn't the right thing to do. So, um, so we we found innovative ways to do that as a by recreating it as a maintained school but that option wouldn't be open to us in the future. So as it as the current sort of framework stands, uh, it, it, the power um, uh, lies with the uh, multi-academy trust. However, part of the discussion we've been having today, and I can't you know, go too, too much detail about it, but it's precisely about accountability and legitimacy and uh, how do those in, in a fully uh, trust world, how do, how do those sorts of concerns get met and who is held to account in in those circumstances um so those those debates are very live within government and i think the other thing to watch for of course is we we don't know this this the the white paper was drafted under um i think it's fair to say secretary of state that was very pragmatic and wanted to see and less ideological and was really interested in um, uh, sort of uh, in, improving um, and working alongside local authorities uh, between and trusts in, in a collaborative way. We, we don't know what next week will bring. Um, we don't know who the new Secretary of State is. We don't know who the new schools minister will be and whether they will take forward the proposals in what is a white paper it's not legislation and you know the uh, education is is a policy area that's littered with um non-enacted white papers so let's wait and see thank you Steve. any other questions answer out uh, thank you um yeah just uh I was very interesting from Steve uh, to hear the conversations uh, he's having on multi academy trusts and you know, as councillor Andre and I know full too well from the first day we were elected was the same day as uh, Sandown Bay Academy was uh, AET announced the closure of that, which was uh, a very quite a happy and an unhappy day in equal measure, I would say. Um, and also 2030 is a long way away in politics, so I think a lot can change between now and then. Uh, my question, however, is regarding the tutoring courses. Uh, I didn't quite understand how they occur. Are they one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring courses or outside of hours tutoring courses? Could you just clarify that for me? Uh, schools have now been given funding to spend on tutoring as they see fit. So the first round of the scheme required schools to follow a formula and go to specific places, but they now have been given the funding so that they can choose what suits the needs of their pupils best. So some of the children will be having group tutoring in school. So they might have had a, a teacher that's recently retired that they can now pay to come back and do some one to one with them in, in classrooms or small groups. Uh, there might be a, a child that has a specific unit of chemistry in secondary school that they're struggling with. So they might hire a tutor to do that particular bit of chemistry with them. So schools now have the flexibility to use that money in a way that best meets their needs. The problem they're having now is finding the people that they want to deliver these outcomes that they've, they've decided the children need. So they're very good at deciding how to spend it. And they're so pleased that it's been devolved to them to spend. But we're not quite home yet. Thank you uh, for doing that impeccably neutral, neutrally, Natalie. I think I might have struggled. Um, so moving on to the uh, green paper. Who's taking the green paper? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm going to take you through the green paper uh, briefly. And, and as you will all know, there were changes made to the SEND uh, legislation in 2014. And this green paper seeks to uh, rectify or change some of the legislation that was put in place at that time. So um, 
we see it as some challenges to solve, uh, as some of the changes before has caused some of the issues that we'll come on to later on. So um, three challenges have been identified um, around that we think out of the green paper. And some of those are around stating that the outcomes for children with SEND and in alternative provision are, are poor. Um, if we take us back to what Natalie was saying earlier around the white paper, was making sure that all children re reach age expected, um, age related expectations. Some children with SEND are not going to reach age related expectations because of the nature of their SEN. So we do still find the challenges across both the green and the white papers will, will if they come to fruition, will cause us challenges moving forward. So we just need to bear that in mind that there are some instances that are still challenging us or will challenge us moving forward as or if the green paper comes into some sort of legislation. They also report that navigating the SEND system and alternative provision is not always positive for us, for some of our families. And I think uh, we would probably all agree with that. You know, sometimes where children have been excluded or sometimes where parents feel that a mainstream school is not appropriate, for them to identify the appropriate pathway for their child sometimes is not as clear as they would need it to be. So I think we would welcome the fact that actually those pathways are clearer and we know where those children can go to school and, and how they would progress through those systems. And I will say the last one, and I think we will all know this, that the current system is not delivering value for money. You're all aware of the high needs block and the spend on that and where that's overspending. So I think we would all seek to be able to have some changes to, um, to that area. So this, the idea was around having new national standards. So setting out how the needs are identified and met on the Isle of Wight, as in Hampshire, we have a really good SEND support guidance. So we think we're ahead of the curve with this. We feel that the national standards will probably go a little bit further, but we'll set out very clearly where they feel children's needs can be met in a school, either at SEN support or with an EHC plan in a mainstream school rather than requiring a specialist placement. So I think it, we would welcome seeing those standards. Um, as long as they set out very clearly what, what the expectations are and how schools can uh, meet those needs for children within their school. We have been seeing, um, and the island is no different, where often where uh, an EHC plan is issued, parents require their child to go to a more specialist school placement straight away rather than having their needs met in a mainstream school. So it will be interesting to see how that comes out and how those new national standards actually dovetail with our SEND support guidance, because I think we are in a very, very good place here. They're looking to revise the SEND code of practice and ensure that that reflects those standards. So again, that, that can't be a bad thing. There are some areas in the current code of practice that are a little bit woolly, so it'll be good to tighten up on some of those areas. And they're also seeking to establish a multi-agency SEND partnership, which will produce a local SEND inclusion plan. Now, we've already got a SEND board in um, the Isle of Wight, which has a multi-agency um, attendance. So we have health, we have social care, uh, we have parent carers, we, we have a number of people on that board. So again, we're in a very good position that if we need that multi-agency centre partnership, we've already got that at the moment. So again, we're in a very good position to be able to take that forward. And as part of the SEND inspection that we had a little while ago, we we did very well. We, we didn't get a written statement of action and, and the report was really positive, but we did have an action plan outside of that. So we know we've got to review the action plan and we have to refresh it along with our self-evaluation in readiness for the next inspection. Um, so this is all on our lines to, to be able to move that forward. And once we get the new then code of practice, we can do that. But we're already reviewing it and seeing where we need to move on. So again, we're in a really good position for um, hopefully if, if the green paper comes into legislation as it is. The next element is, is a little bit more difficult, I think, is what, what it's saying is, is that we need to support families to express a preference for suitable placement by providing a tailored list of settings. So we have a raft of mainstream and special provision on the island. We also have independent provision on the island. So if we had to work together to provide a list, we've got that across the island. So again, we're in a very strong position. However, one of the elements in, in the code of practice says very clearly that we have to be mindful about um, public expenditure 
and making sure that any decisions made in um, with placements are mindful of that we're in in line with keeping in line with public expenditure and making sure we're not um, spending money on, on placements that are not appropriate. So it's how will this balance the requirement of the parental preference and balancing the need for to be mindful of public expenditure. So again, it's not yet clear on how we may balance that if we're having to provide a list of schools, because some of those list of schools in the local area may be in the independent sector and may be considerable more expensive than our own mainstream schools. So I think it will be interesting to see how that, that plays out. And the other element um, around that and around working with parents is around uh, providing mandatory mediation before tribunal. Mediation by um, the nature of it is about where two sides want to come together and want to talk about and want to solve an issue. If we're mandating that, how do we make sure that parents want to come around that table and want to talk to us? You know, or we can actually um, negotiate because there may be areas where we can't negotiate. So it, again, it will be interesting to see how mandatory mediation prior to a tribunal moves forward and how that, that becomes an area where we can work with parents uh, effectively, because that's what we want at the end of the day. Tribunals at the moment are growing um, and on the island, they're no different to anywhere else. And most of the outcomes in tribunals do rule in favour of parents. So um, again, it will be interesting to see how that's changed. We also talk about uh, providing excellent uh, provision and they talk about increasing income to schools by 7 billion by 24 25 compared to the figures in 21 22. They talk about a new SENCO qualification, so a new MPQ qualification. We already have a SENCO award, which we work towards delivering uh, to our schools. The points that we've raised when we've been given the opportunity to feed back to the DFE is um, SENCOs often in schools don't always sit on leadership teams, and how does SENCO? Um, how do they influence inclusion in the school and, and, and where that is? So I think there's some thoughts about, you know, we welcome SENCO qualifications, we welcome the upskilling of teachers, but is it the right place to sit that, that qualification around SEMD? They're also going to commission analysis to better understand the health support that's required in schools. And I think we, we would also see that there has been an increase in mental health needs for many of our children coming through the pandemic and it will be interesting to see how health come forward with that and how that's going to look because at the moment the code of practice does not mandate health to provide um, for the EHC needs assessment it says they should but they don't have to and also improving the mainstream curriculum provision in teaching and learning and of course obviously we're already working on those work we, we work all the time with our schools in the Isle of Wight around how we can improve the curriculum and our mainstream provision so obviously what we want to do out of this is keep more children in mainstream um, as much as possible and also in, in in line with that it's around providing additional funding around respite placement so the government is seeking to fund 30 million pounds with additional 10,000 additional respite placements and also invest in uh, capital for new specialist placements or improving existing provision. On the Isle of Wight we get a capital allowance to improve our provision and we are also uh, submitting an application for a new free school on the island which again will hopefully help us with our high needs spend. They're investing 18 million in supporting internships which is really good uh, because we want to encourage our children to become independent, to access education, further education, but also move into the world of work, because that's what our young people tell us. They want to be independent, they want to have a relationship, and they want to work and they want to earn money. So that's what we should be encouraging our children to do, is to make sure that's, that's where we want them to go, rather than us seeing the cycle of children staying in education or young people staying in education and doing duplicate courses year after year. And obviously we've already touched on it, so I'm not gonna go into it, um, around all, all schools joining a multi-academy trust. So, it, I, you know, I won't go into that. We've talked about that. So, it, SEMD and the review wants us to be part of an integrated SEND system. It wants us to create funding stability. It wants us to create a um, performance framework. And I think we have a strong commissioning framework and arrangements on the island anyway. So, we're really good on how we fund additional provision on the island. 
We want a greater oversight of pupil movements, and Natalie touched on that, on a register of children who are not in school. Um, so again, we need to have that oversight. Who's in school? Who's in full time? Where are they? And those children that are missing education. So it would be really good for us to do that. And obviously, at the moment, all there was a call for evidence on the use of unregistered provision. We would want all of our alternative provision to be registered. We wouldn't want to see any of our children in unregistered provision. So that has got to be a good thing. And, you know, as we said, all schools to be in a multi academy trust. So there's, there's going to be um, accountability and a requirement for accountability moving forward. And there's hopefully going to be um, a clarity of roles there. And um, DF, we've already started to see DFE put new regional groups into place around local authorities. So we're starting to see an expansion of the DfE and move into supporting regions and having more regional advisors. So again, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. They're also going to be providing guidance to integrated care boards. And of course, on the Isle of Wight, we've got an integrated care board that's just come in that's, that's across Southampton, Portsmouth, Hampshire and um, here. We've also uh, seeing that they want a new inclusion dashboard. So again, it will be really interesting to be able to see uh, a clear dashboard with children's data um, if that comes in. But also they're talking about a national banding system and a price tariff for schools. So um, we already have a banding system for our mainstream schools here. It will be interesting to see whether where we sit with our banding system compared to national. So it could be a benefit to us, but if some of those banding systems sit higher, our high needs obviously are already taking a hit, it, it could have a disadvantage. But it, it might be interesting to see how that banding system and those price tariffs work, particularly where the independent sector is supposed to be coming into that. So again, we know that they cost um, higher than, than our schools and also a new Ofsted area inspection framework so we'll wait to see at the moment where that goes they are looking to trial areas at the moment on testing the um, Ofsted framework and again we, we will be ready for that when it when it comes so in addition to that you you already know that the Isle of Wight is part of the safety valve program so we will be having those discussions with the DfE around bringing our spend and our high needs into line um, by I think it's 26 27 Hampshire in the delivering better value program um, and I think it'd be really good to see the learning across both authorities because the de delivering better value program is really in depth. Um, the task the DfE have got with drafting the new national SEND standards when um, I went to an event recently with the DfE and, and Steve's obviously working with them quite closely it was quite clear they didn't quite know where they were going with that so it will be interesting to see how that develops and they were asking for a lot of expertise to feed in good practice across local authorities so it will be, be good to see. There's obviously a change management program where the government have committed 70 million pounds um, and the expectation is to do uh, publish a new delivery plan and uh, have a new national delivery board. So there are some of the highlights out of the Green Paper. The consultation on the Green Paper closed in July, so we are waiting to see what the outcome of that will be. Um, and it will be really interesting to see when, um, how we move forward with that and see where they come up. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Outlaw. Very quick one. What's the SENCO qualification, please? So at the moment, we've got Special Educational Needs Coordinator uh, in schools, all of them have to have a SENCO award. Uh, I think within three years, Natalie, is it of becoming a SENCO, the SENCO award, they have to be qualified. So they're now talking about bringing in a national and MPQ qualification. So do you remember a few years ago they brought up the new, new MPQ for headships? So it's supposed to be on a similar level. So they're changing the award. Thank you. Councillor Christensen. Thank you. I think this. Along with the white paper as well, I think both these papers, I always want to see more importance put on the well-being and support of children. I always think when we're looking at poor outcomes and we never sort of relate the two and I'm just wondering how we can make that more important. I, you know, seeing these all come out and they never, like you say, they haven't given that, the, the funding, the importance perhaps that you would have wanted, I, I, you know, sort of from what you said, I, I don't really know <laughs> your full opinion on it, but I just wonder how we can make that more important because I feel that they really correlate, especially with the SEND category, that that, that well-being, that importance on their emotional support that they need, 
I feel like we, we could do more with that. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, th I think we fed that back, I think, and, and Steve's obviously in a really good position in working with DFE at the moment and making sure that we feed that well-being back in, particularly around support from CAMS and health and coming out of the pandemic. We're starting to see the impact on that on children's mental health and anxiety and school refusal. So we are starting to see that and we'll be feeding that back in. We have fed it back in quite strongly in and around that. And I'm sure every local authority has done the same. But I think we're in the same position as we were with the white paper. This is a green paper. We don't know what next week will bring. We don't know what will end up in legislation and how that will change. So I think it's going to be watch this space a little bit to see what, you know, what the proposals are, but what actually ends up in that finished legislation or into law moving forward. Thank you. Uh, just one point before we move on is the uh, highlight of seven billion extra for schools is a figure that I'm sure we'd all be quite happy were it ours. Uh, what does that actually mean per school? Because I'm worried it's not as significant as people would like it to be. And I don't expect to give an exact number, but what number would you like it to be to see significant improvement? Steve might be the one to answer this. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> um, Part of the, uh, uh, you probably lit the blue touch paper here, Chair, unfortunately. Um, part of the problem is that as we have more children in the SEN system and nationally that has expanded by about 100%, um, then there is a cost to that. There's a cost whether it's more learning support assistance or whether it's a special school or whether it's um, uh, independent special school. And um, the national deficit on SEN is about 2.6 billion pounds, according to data published by, I think it was CCN Network. So, and the thing about it is, is that that's baked in, but which means it won't reduce because um, all of those children have got a secure place and they're gonna be, be there for the next X number of years. So that is going to increase over the next few years. So I suspect, but I don't know, that the £7 billion is a projection to stand still from where we are. So I don't think that puts any more, um, I don't think it puts additional cash into the system, well it obviously puts additional cash in the system, but it doesn't put any additional cash into the system over and above what is projected to be needed on the basis of the expansion of SEN, um, which was brought about by the 2014 Act. Unfortunately, you've confirmed what I was thinking, but thank you, Steve. That is uh, as I expected. Any other questions or any other No, well, we've done very well. So moving on to uh, the committee's work plan. Uh, mainly just be noted, we've done very well actually as a committee. Thank you, John. Um, we've, uh, you've done very well in organising the work plan. I think it looks very full and meaningful for the years, year or so ahead. Any questions, any thoughts, anything to add? No, excellent, even better. So members question time. Uh, Steve, do you need to go and catch a train or anything? Rather than the uh, I'm, I, I'm okay at the moment, but I've got 10% of battery life left. Um, oh, that, <laughs> so, that old chestnut. Yeah, that old know. chestnut, that's right. So if I dis I'll get around, but if, I'll di if I disappear, uh, you know why. <laughs> thank you. Uh, any members, quite, any questions at all in general? No, excellent. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you those that attended uh, from across the water. Apologies for it being like Gotham City in here tonight. I like 12 sirens and no hour. It's not normally like that. I mean, it makes it sound like we live somewhere really exciting. But um, uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, and again, to the committee members, thank you again for, for taking part in the way that we, we intend to. Have a pleasant evening and a pleasant weekend, everybody. Thank you.